destiny was wildly outside of his depth. In fact oh, okay, thank God. At least she's gonna bring up a couple points or a couple parts where Norm either directly refuted something I said or where I was completely and totally incorrect. Oh God, I'm so excited for this. All right, finally, finally, a substantive critique. Here we go. Crystal Ball's response to your debate at the end of this video is dumb. Where? Then, you know, then you get to, you, when you do it that way, you can at least understand logically, like where both sides would be able to come from. So if we, it depends on the which frame that we want. His selective application thing, I thought was an excellent, excellent point. Yeah, and there. I think the, the law of the jungle as we're watching unfold, mm. I think it's I think it's horrifying. I think people around the world, the majority of people in this country are horrified. It's gotten to the point that, you know, even Joe Biden has to pretend like he's horrified, even though this is his policy that we're watching play out. But yeah, if you if you want to wave away as they do, oh, international laws are relevant, you don't understand the way the world works, no one cares about these international bodies, et cetera, stop telling me about the barbarism of, of Hamas. Stop telling me about how many civilians you massacre, they massacred, because in your telling of the story, those things are irrelevant. You know, the only consistent moral position is to condemn the attacks on civilians. No I don't understand why these retards think this. People say, <clears throat> Like, I don't even agree with Benny's position that like international law is irrelevant. But somebody will be like, international law is irrelevant. And it's like, oh, if you think international law is irrelevant, then you can't condemn Hamas's actions. What? What do you mean? These have nothing to do with each other. It would make sense if Israel was saying, we want the international community to help us because what Hamas did was illegal. I don't think Israel's asking for that. Israel doesn't give a f They don't expect anybody to help them because of international law. You can condemn attacks or not get an X because of your moral standards or whatever that have nothing to do with international law. What? what? This, this point is nothing. It doesn't connect to anything that's been said ever. No matter who it comes from, you know, whether you agree with their cause or you don't agree with their cause, that's the only cons consistent position. It's a position that, you know, Norman Malin are both perfectly comfortable in, both perfectly comfortable for calling for, you know, um, ICC mm -hmm. hearings and review of what happened. Wait, but Norm says he doesn't care about international law because he is okay with the Houthis shooting ships in the ocean. Wait, it's not, that's not consistent at all. What do you mean? Happened on both sides and those who committed war crimes being held to account. But, um, you know, it, it was very illuminating to watch at this point that extended of a debate where you can't just do but Hamas, you can't just filibuster for a few minutes where you actually have to try to detail your points. At this point, given what we know, attempting to fully defend Israel as a moral actor was a very revealing exercise. It's interesting. Maybe I will listen to uh, more of it. All right, we'll see you guys later. I know it was a long one, but we'll get it to you <laughs> as long as we can. We're on the ground. Crystal, what are you taking a look at? Podcaster Lex Friedman recently hosted a roughly five hour long debate on Israel-Palestine that was frustrating, combative at times, but nevertheless, extraordinarily revealing. The debate featured author and scholar Norman Finkelstein, analyst and researcher Mouline Rabani, arguing the Palestinian perspective. On the pro-Zionist side, you had author and historian Benny Morris and YouTuber Stephen Bennell, also known as Destiny. Now, if your immediate reaction is that one of these individuals doesn't quite fit in with the rest, you are correct, and it was painfully obvious the entire five hours. Now, if your immediate reaction is that one of you had author and scholar Norman Finkelstein, and it was frustrating, combative at times, but nevertheless, extraordinarily revealing. The debate featured author and scholar Norman Finkelstein, analyst and researcher Mouline Rabani, arguing the Palestinian perspective. On the pro-Zionist side, you had author and historian Benny Morris and YouTuber, what does scholar mean? Is there an official definition for that? I don't like that people put up Benny Morris and Norman Finkelstein as like they're the same level of historian. They're not at all. It's not even remotely close. I hate that people draw an equivalence between these things. If you want to say that people didn't uh, belong in this uh, debate, I, like sure, maybe. But that would mean that like the only one that belonged there was Benny Morris. Nobody, um, nobody else in that room was even remotely uh, at the level that Benny Morris was. I, so the idea that... Stephen Bennell, also known as Destiny. Now, if your immediate reaction is that one of these individuals doesn't quite fit in with the rest, you are correct. And it was painfully obvious the entire five hours that Destiny was wildly on side of his depth. In fact oh, okay, thank God. At least she's gonna bring up a couple points or a couple parts where Norm either directly refuted something I said or where I was completely and totally incorrect. Oh God, I'm so excited for this. All right, finally, finally, a substantive critique. Here we go. Although many of the viral clips from the debate involved Destiny's humiliation at the hands of Norm Finkelstein, the truth is that for most of the debate, he was kind of irrelevant, sitting like a child at the grown-ups table. His presence was nevertheless useful for helping to illustrate the combination of ignorance, willful blindness, and debate bro tricks of the trade that are required to fully defend the Israeli position at this point in time. Benny Morris and Destiny threw every propaganda device in the Hasbara playbook up against the wall to see what would stick. So let's see how it went in the face of what at this point is an undeniable and indefensible- What, all the propaganda devices? What? <laughs> reality. 
So first up, any good Hasbara campaign has got to start with a fairy tale view of history. Now, in this history, the only permitted victims are Jewish people who no doubt were horribly victimized in the Holocaust. And in this history, the only just response to those atrocities is not for the US or the UK or Germany or the Soviet Union to provide justice, peace, and safety for the Jewish people, but rather to impose that burden entirely on a people who had nothing to do with the Holocaust and who had, in fact, been, by and large, living peaceably alongside indigenous Jews for centuries. In other words, the only solution to a European atrocity was to give license to an additional atrocity, the ethnic cleansing of the native Arab Palestinian population from- Could you, I like how she probably doesn't even know like anything. I doubt she knows anything about Israel Palestine. She probably thinks the West Bank is to the west of the Gaza Strip. That's the level of knowledge we're dealing with here. I think that she, there's probably a script writer for the teleprompter and she's just reading the script that like somebody in the back row for her. She didn't watch any of this. She has no idea what the fuck she's talking about. And that's 100 billion percent their own land. The only acceptable response of that Palestinian population was then to meekly accept their dispossession. To do otherwise is to prove that Arabs from the beginning were violent, unreasonable, and anti-Semitic. This was a matter of quite a lot of debate at the beginning of the podcast. Here, for example, is Destiny challenging the idea that expulsion or ethnic cleansing was a core and necessary element of Zionism from the outset. A claim that gets brought up a lot has to do with the inevitability of transfer in Zionism, or the idea that as soon as the Jews envisioned a state in Palestine, they knew that it would involve some mass transfer of population, perhaps a mass expulsion. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about Plan Dalit or Plan D at some point. The issue that <laughs> I didn't even run into is, while you can find quotes from leaders, while you can find maybe desires expressed in diaries, I feel like it's hard to truly ever know if there would have been mass transfer in the face of Arab peace, because I feel like every time there was a huge deal on the table that would have had a sizable Jewish and Arab population living together, the Arabs would reject it out of hand. So for instance, when we say that transfer was inevitable, when we say that Zionists would have never accepted, you know, a sizable Arab population. Can you give a steel man explanation of how these people get these takes from the conversation? Well, not to sound like Mimi or whatever, but like 98% of people commenting on this haven't watched more than like three or four minutes of it. The way that it works is you hear somebody else's characterization of it and then you repeat that characterization as though you watched it. This is why when I when I say things, when I bring things up and I'm like, oh, uh, I heard this about this thing. If I only read headlines or if I only, I'll try to say that. Like, yeah, I saw these headlines on Twitter. So I assume this is what it's about. I try to say that. And rather than saying like, oh yeah, this debate, this, this person said that or that, because I haven't watched it, I don't really know. Um, especially now that I'm vibe out and I can read everything. I'll usually just try to, I'll try to say if I'm giving you somebody else's summary or like, oh, I saw this just like a few comments on Reddit or whatever, because yeah, pe people will pass it off as though they've watched the whole thing. Well, I, my point here is entirely, this is a perfect point. I'm so curious what the counter is to this point. This would have been a thing, by the way, if it was a one-on-one -on -one debate, this is what I would have harped on and I would have screamed at somebody. What is one deal that the Arabs accepted that would have had Jews living there? What is a single deal? One deal, a single deal. Cause I can point to like at least three that the Jews accepted. Give me one, give me one, one deal. The Jews were okay with the split in the Peel Commission. The Jews were okay with the split in 47 for the partition plan. The Jews were okay with the split in 52 at the Lusain Peace Conference. Give me one deal that the Arabs accepted with any amount of Jewish people living there from Europe. Any, one deal. What is the counter to that argument? Just one counter, What one counter. Rejected out of hand. So for instance, when we say that transfer was inevitable, when we say that Zionists would have never accepted, you know, a sizable Arab population, how do you explain the acceptance of the 47 partition plan that would have had a huge Arab population living in the Jewish state? Is your contention that after the acceptance of that, after the establishment of that state, that Jews would have slowly started to expel all of these Arab citizens from their country? Or how do you explain that in Lusan a couple years later that Israel was willing to formally answer? God, the most humiliating part here is you can see that like if you look at the curved corners of the lips here as Benny Morris is looking down, Benny Morris is thinking of two things. One, he's like, God, everything my debate partner is saying is so stupid and then he's looking down at my machine over here um it's kind of hard to tell here but there is um one of the things i did for this debate is i reskinned the wikipedia thing y basically you can run it through like uh there's like an add-on you can get and then you can apply different css styles so it looks like it might be like notes or some like lame shit that i might have worked on in my free time <laughs> no it's actually just the wiki page but it's with a black background and then you can apply different colors to different paragraphs to make it look like something you've worked on so but benny obviously can see through this and he's incredibly disappointed the entire time he's like nodding along like oh fuck me i'm gonna be next to this fucking moron for five hours kill me all of these Arab citizens from their country? Or how do you explain that in Lusana a couple years later that Israel was willing to formally annex the Gaza Strip and make 200,000 or so people those citizens? But, I, but I'm, I'm just curious, how, how do we get this idea of Zionism always means mass transfer? And there were times, at least early on in the history of Israel and, and a little bit before it, where Israel would have accepted a state that would have had- There's no real response to any of my questions in this entire f***ing debate, by the way. Uh, th th there's not a single response to any of these points. It drives me crazy. Massive Arab population in it. Is your, yeah, is your idea that they would have just slowly expelled them afterwards? Yes. In fact, expulsion or apartheid is the only logical outcome of establishing a Jewish state in a land that was and is majority Muslim Arab. <laughs> Wait, what? Oh, oh, well, f me. I didn't know you could just say, yeah, they would have. Holy shit. Oh. My bad. They would have just done it. Oh, well, f me. What an ingenious 
fucking argument. Holy sh- I never considered that they might have just did the thing and fuck it, who cares? Well, holy fuck me. My God. It's an Arab population in it. Is your, yeah, is your idea that they would have just slowly expelled them afterwards? Yes. In fact, expulsion or apartheid is the only logical outcome of establishing a Jewish state. In That's crazy. How do you explain the two million Arab Israelis living there right now? How do you explain the fact that right now there are more Arabs living in Israel proper than Jews have ever lived in every single Arab state combined in the history of all of mankind? How would you explain that? Why didn't they expel them? A land that was and is majority Muslim Arab. Zionist leaders at the time were pretty open about this and about the necessity of violence and conflict with that indigenous population. For example, Joseph Weitz, head of the Jewish Agency's Colonization Department, said in 1940, quote, between ourselves, it must be clear that there is no room for both peoples together in this country. We shall not achieve our goal if the Arabs are in this small country. There is no other way than to transfer the Arabs. You know, she doesn't know anything about anything that's going on. Yes, this quote was in 1940. The whole Arab revolts were from 36 to 39. It was a ton of violence it already started to happen benny morris literally addresses us into the debate your writers didn't even watch the debate yes the whole point was that arab violence was making coexistence impossible this happened after the peel commission the, the peel commission had already recommended partition of these lands the arab revolts had already happened the, the, and nothing was working so yeah they were like okay well it doesn't work <sighs> from here two neighboring countries all of them not one village not one tribe should be left Crazy that there were huge villages and tribes left, though. Isn't that strange that even though Weizmann might have wanted this, that's not what actually happened? So, pretty clear cut. And there are plenty of other historical... Oh, clear cut. Well, oh, well if you have one quote, huh, f me, I guess. Well, it's besides that that make it clear early Zionist leaders realized their ideology would inevitably result in conflict with Palestinians. Some acknowledged that Arab resistance was in fact logical and even just, and that they would also- f Bro, you need to get future interlocutors to agree upfront that by participating in the debate, they acknowledge that you are worth their time to engage with, never seen such epic proportions of cope, barely seen any critiques of anything you brought up, just add on. It is good, trust me, it's good. The more I look back and the more different comments I read, especially now as more people watch it, I feel good about everything, I think it's good. I think Norm, I think Norm showed his ass hardcore. But also, I can't make these demands because it's not my platform. But it's good. I think everything went well. Fervently resist displacement if the roles had been reversed. Now, it is this point about the reasonable and, in fact, inevitable nature of Palestinian resistance to Zionism that Moeen Rabani picks up on. In doing so, he lays waste to the idea that Palestinians, in rejecting the original 1948 UN partition plan, were out of line, or even that it was inherently anti-Semitic to reject a Jewish state being established on a portion of their land at all. I mean, um, uh, one doesn't have to sympathize. Is she going to mistake the feelings that Jewish people might have had, that they're basically being locked into Europe and holocausted as saying that, because now they're being denied uh, immigration to Palestine because the Brits started to limit the amount of immigration. She, that's what she's bringing up. She, she, I don't know why, I'm not, I don't care about any of this. She, has, she, hasn't, she didn't watch any of this. And she has no idea what she's talking about. Why am I getting triggered by a teleprompter? I, I don't need to plan were out of line, or even that it was inherently anti-Semitic to reject a Jewish state being established on a portion of their land at all. I mean, um, uh, one doesn't have to sympathize with the Palestinians um, to recognize that they have now been a stateless people for 75 years. Can you name any country? Well, they were a stateless people for the entirety of their existence. Because there is no Palestinian state, nor has there ever been. But... Unless you want to say the Ottoman Empire was our state, but... Yours, for example, or yours for five years. Can you name any country, yours, for example, or yours, that would be prepared to give 55%, 25%? <sighs> <sighs> people like Muin are why people say anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. The reason why, and he said this kind of, but unfortunately so much of the debate was wasted on Finkelstein's honestly disrespectful cadence. And when I say that, I just mean that his speed of talking is not conducive to live conversation. He either needs to bring along an assistant or he needs to bring along some sort of caretaker or he needs to pre-write. Uh, we can give him questions if he needs to pre-write. Somebody speaking this slowly and with this level of imprecision to drag the conversation down is wasting everybody's time. There's no excuse for that. He's not that old. Uh, he's not, like the fact that he doesn't know what a phone is, it's ridiculous, okay? But this guy says so many things. I don't know if people, I hate how many people, honest to God, the most upsetting thing about this whole debate was how many people came away thinking that he was super reasonable. Just so you know, we 
king's position is that the state of Israel has to be completely disassembled. That whole state needs to go. It needs to be trashed. And another Arab majority state, the 527th one, needs to be erected in its place. That is his position. He says it in plain English. Not like, well, if you take what he said. He said the only way that this works is if Israel is disassembled as a state. That's it. It has to be destroyed as a state. And then another Arab majority state needs to be erected in its place. The leeway. Thanks to the 150 uh, viewer host. 10%? of your country to the Palestinians? Of course not. Like, think about what the analogy even means here. And he says it more explicitly later on. Like, oh, you wouldn't give any of your house to a, to a burglar. You wouldn't give any of your country. Oh, so there should have been no Israeli state at all. So ethnically cleanse them, expel them, genocide them. What, do you, what should happen? And so um, the issue was not the existence of Jews in Palestine. Um, they had been there for centuries. No one has ever made that. What a straw man. You think Benny Morris doesn't know that there were, what, was it like 10,000 indigenous Jews that had lived in the region? I know that number. Everybody knows the number. Wikipedia knows that number. Why are you even bringing this up? There wasn't an issue with Jews. First of all, there have been pogroms against Jews or pogroms against Jews throughout Ottoman Empire history. Regardless, that's neither here nor there. But we all know that that's not the issue. Of course, it's not the Jews that were living there. We all know that. Why bring this point up? Like, it strengthens your argument. Like, somebody here is making an anti-Semitic argument on the other side of the table. Nobody said this. Illuminator. Thanks for the five gift of subs. Danny Pruitt, 20 bucks. You often engage with the more left-leaning people in these things. Brianna on the Hill, Crystal on this. Might be a good idea to engage with their counterparts. Robbie Hill and Cigar are populist, but more sane. Centuries. And of course they had ties to Palestine and particularly to Jerusalem and, and other places going back centuries, if not millennia. Um, but the idea of establishing... Don't ban me, but does Muin not argue in favor of a two-state solution? I heard him say in this debate, I'm pretty sure multiple times, that all of Israel needs to be destroyed. The whole state needs to be taken apart. I'm 99% sure I've heard him say that explicitly, at least once, I think twice. An exclusively Jewish state at the expense of those who are already living there. I think it was right to... Jewish state. What does he mean by exclusively Jewish state? It wouldn't have been exclusively Jews, unless he means exclusively Jewish in character, but what an odd way to phrase that. Are you a Cornhuskers fan? Shut the fuck up. But the idea of establishing... Not since Osborne left. ...establishing an exclusively Jewish state at the expense of those who are already living there. I think it was right to reach... I, there are so many things to fight on here, too. At the expense of? What do you mean at the expense of? Here is, I'm gonna, okay. Oh shit, hold on, I'm sorry. Ah, oh, the Mossad is channeling through me right now. Ah, oh, the Mossad is channeling through me right now. My assumption would be, and I could be totally wrong, somebody go Google this, look at this up, at the expense of those living in the area. My assumption would be that the Arabs that live in Israel probably enjoy some of the highest standards of living in the entire greater Middle East region. That'd be my guess. Is there a way to look that up? Do you think that's right or do you think that's wrong? That'd be my guess. Stephen5384, thank you for the 50 gifted memberships. Would you consider writing a book about Israel-Palestine? Fuck no. <laughs> I don't know, bro. It would take me too much stream time away. I need to get banned from YouTube or some shit, and then I'll go do dumb shit like this. Is it considered bad to be a Zionist? The term is made to be a pejorative at this point. Do people define it def definitively or something? Um... The problem is that Zionists can mean a whole bunch of different things. That's the problem. Um, like, <clears throat> Dubai and Qatar have a better standard of living for the average citizen. Is that true? Or I know the royalty there lives good, although like half the people apparently are royalty in Qatar and, <laughs> and the UAE. So who knows? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the lower level people or the lower class people, or whatever. I don't know what the poorest live like in Saudi Arabia or in Dubai. I have no idea. What does it mean to have Jewish character? I think I've heard that term multiple times. I think it just means that like you don't get basically killed <laughs> and pogromed everywhere. And then there's some weird religious shit tied in. But I mean like as much as any other country, like about marriage or dumb shit like that. Did you foresee the response this debate has gotten or did you hold out hope that people would actually address the content? No, I am happy with the response. I am very happy. I am happy. I'm super happy. I'm happy because, I've said this before, and I'm not trying to dick ride myself, okay? But I will dick ride myself a little bit. These guys have been studying this for a long time. I've studied this for four or five months, maybe, and I could have done more. 
uh, I feel like I held my own. I think that if I would have made, like I said, if I would have made a single mistake in this conversation, I would be eviscerated for it. If I would have made multiple, it would be completely over. The fact that I was able to sit down in a five hour conversation with, this guy is probably like the most quoted Western pop historian. Every shitty talking point comes from him. I'm not entirely sure what Moon's background is, but it seems like he's got a lot of background in this area. And then Benny Morris, obviously he's like the preeminent fucking Israeli historian. The fact that I was able to sit at this table for five or six hours and have a conversation and not make a single mistake, I think I'm happy with that performance. And the fact that everybody's just like personally insulting me, I just think feeds into that. So I'm okay with it. Jack that. And I don't think we can look back now, 75 years later, and say, well, you should have accepted losing 55% of your homeland because you ended up losing 78% of it, and the remaining 22% was occupied in 1967. That's that's not how things work. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I can I can imagine I can imagine an American rejecting giving 10% of the United States to the Palestinians. Yeah, but that's because America, it, the, the, the start is not even remotely similar. It's not even remotely similar. I think the five hour debate format kind of hurts because no one bothered to watch it and just goes by what people say on Twitter. I think people notice. I do think people notice. I've seen a lot of like random people, even some that pick up quite a bit of traction who have said things like, oh, like I keep hearing that this guy did really good in this debate, but all I see is him screaming insults. And then as the days kind of rolled on for people that did completely watch it, I saw other people somebody's like, well, hold on, wait, Norm, this guy was supposed to be a scholar, but why didn't he say anything scholarly? Why didn't he bring him any good points? Why is he just screaming like a baby rager the whole time? So I think it's okay. Do you think it's worth watching or do you feel like you did all right based on what you had? Wait, hold on, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, you must have uh, caught some of the Hassan talking points. We watched this whole debate when it came out. I didn't avoid watching us if you heard that. <laughs> it's not true. And if that rejection leads to war and you lose half your country, I doubt that 50 years from now you're going to say, well, maybe I should have accepted that. So they didn't accept the establishment of an explicitly Jewish state because the inevitable outcome was some version of exactly the apartheid, ethnic cleansing, and now out-and-out -out genocide that we are seeing play out. That none of that, none of that makes sense. But I'm not even mad at her. I'm just mad at whoever wrote the script for her teleprompter. <sighs> what are their names on Twitter? Is it crystal? Oh, crystal ball, I see her. Okay. This was a point that Norman Finkelstein made quite eloquently talking about the version of- Oh, eloquently. Norm said that the, Norm said that being an anti-Semite is part of the human condition. He's fully brain dead. The, that, that part is important for him to establish is because he's trying to excuse anti-Semitism. That's the point of that. I don't even like to talk about anti-Semitism, it's so cringe. But when you say that, the point is to excuse anti-Semitism, right? Some guy walks in, a boss walks in and he says to his employee, you're a dirty fucking N-word. And the guy, the, the black guy, you know, is like, looking to HR and so what's going on? And HR's like, well, come on, everybody's a little bit racist, right? The reason why you say that, the reason why you elevate the, the, the background levels of anti-Semitism or racism or whatever is to make it seem like, ah, eh, everybody's a little bit racist. To say that, to utter that, everybody's got a little bit of anti-Semitism when Al Husseini was the subject, the guy who recruited troops and shit for the SS, <laughs> it's like unfathomably stupid, but. of nationalism Zionism represents. Most theorists of nationalism say there are two kinds of nationalism. One is a nationalism based on citizenship. You become a citizen, you're integral to the country. That's sometimes called political nationalism. And then there's another kind of nationalism. And that says the state should not belong to its citizens. It should belong to an ethnic group. Each ethnic group should have its own state. It's usually I've never, I've never heard of this before. I, maybe it's true, but like, if we start getting into other like political science shit, I have completely no idea. But this, this sounds like specious speculation because I feel like, arguably, um, like, arguably, arguably, ethnic groups become the people in states. So it, it just seems like a strange distinction to make. But I'm not sure. I, I'm assuming he's referencing other people that have written and thought about this way more than I have off the top of my head, so maybe there's like a better argument to be made here, but. Each ethnic group should have its own state. It's usually called the German romantic idea of nationalism. Zionism is squarely in the Jew German romantic idea 
That was the whole point of Zionism. We don't want to be Bundists and be one more ethnic minority in Russia. We don't want to become citizens and just become a... This was a big idea. Nationalism was originally ethnically based. Yeah, but what I'm saying is I think that... Um, I, I feel like the... I feel like there's more overlap than people realize. So, for instance, actually, you even see it today. People will say, like, oh, Palestinians are a distinct ethnic ethnic group. Jordanians are a distinct ethnic group. Syrians are a distinct... No, they're not. These are borders drawn on a map by, by some asshole in Britain. There's... The fact that they now identify separately ethnically in some ways is like, I think lends a little bit of credence to the idea that if you draw borders and you put a state up, like people will start to slowly divide ethnicities along those lines as well. But, but I don't know, maybe not. Also, like I said, this is like, I have low conviction on this. I've never, I haven't like formally like read into any of these theories or ideas before. Maybe they account for that actually if you look at any of these forms of nationalism, it's possible. So yeah, I don't know. It's just like, I'm random. Jewish people in England. Norm drags his feet while speaking in order to control the conversation. I actually have heard a few people say that. I don't know if that's true or not, but. Or friends, we want our own state. Like the, like the Arab 23 uh, state. No, wait, let's, before we get to the Arabs, let's, get, let's stick to the Jews for a moment, or the Zionists. We want our own state. And in that concept of wanting your own state, the minority at best lives on sufferance and at worst gets expelled that's the logic of the german romantic zionist idea of a state that's why additionally he will interrupt any conversation points that breaks his argument it's why he constantly makes personal insults instead of attacking your argument yeah true hey, they're zionists so the truth is the desires of the early zionists especially after the holocaust but even before the number how is that even an argument he's making a broad argument to a category of things discussed uh like in schools of thought and you think this is a particular argument this is why also this is another thing that i dislike is at some point and it's i guess again it's emblematic of the entire israel palestinian debate at some point let's talk about the facts on the ground who were the people that were exclusionary? Because Jews were willing to accept, and they do to this day, a whole bunch of Arabs living in their state. It doesn't really seem like Arabs were willing to make the same acceptance. Like, is that that controversial? Number of violent pogroms in Europe were completely understandable. As what do you mean just in Europe? It was only in Europe? Cause of black Sorry. nationalism, a similar nationalist ideology, given the horrors of slavery and Jim Crow and other discrimination, also so understandable. But it's also true that though their aspirations were understandable, in reality, Palestine was not a land without a people. And realization of those Zion- Oh, a land without a people. People without a land, a land without- People love to harp on this quote. Ugh. Understandable. In reality, Palestine was not a land without a people. And realization of those Zionist aspirations in Palestine required committing grave injustices against the people who were presently living in that land. Now, in order to accept the fairy tale version of history and to accept the current fairy tale version of Israel, version Joe Biden seems to believe wholeheartedly in where they. You're right. For example, Austrians consider themselves to be Germans up until World War II, but now they consider themselves separate on nationalistic grounds. Oh, maybe. Israeli government would never intentionally target civilians or engage in apartheid or have ethnic cleansing as a policy goal. In order to accept those Disney versions of reality, you got to make a bedrock underlying assumption that Western powers, in every instance, have good intentions. And Palestinians, in every instance, have bad intentions. Now, oftentimes, these assumptions are based in racist worldviews in which Westerners are inherently civilized and Arabs- Why not just, like, look at the deals on the ground? Why not, like, look at the actual agreements that people- Oh, here, also, by the way. Retweet this. Pressure, okay? I want to talk to one of them are inherently barbarians. Netanyahu hints at this when he describes their genocidal assault on Gaza as being a conflict between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. Now, this unshakable belief in the goodness of Western powers was evident throughout the debate. In a jaw-dropping moment, Destiny reveals himself to be fully captured by an almost religious devotion to that benevolent view of Western powers. Take a listen. Uh, it was correctly brought up that I believe that Ben-Gurion had, um, I think Shlomo uh, ben describes it as an obsession with getting validation or support from Western states. Um, Great Britain, and then a couple decades later- That explains the Suez uh, War, the Suez yeah, Crisis. Yeah, exactly, correct. That was one of the major motivators, the idea to work with Britain and France on a military operation Imperial against Imperial stooge. Arabs. But then the question again- I, should have, I shouldn't let him take these. An Imperial stooge. Yeah, and who, and what? Were all the Arab states the stooges of the Soviet Union? 
Like Egypt for a long time was trying to play. Nasser was literally trying to play both ends of this as well, right? And, and that stooge comment that he made, by the way, that imperial stooge comment he made is really telling because later on when he says that he didn't like Sadat, he thought Sadat was a bad leader, probably because he agreed with the guy that assassinated him because he believed that Sadat sold out to the West when they made peace with Israel. I, that was a whole other line of argumentation we could have gone down, but I didn't. But I noticed these comments that he's making throughout the debate. But like, yeah, an imperial stooge? No, it's because they've got the, the biggest guns and the most firepower. And if you're surrounded by a bunch of Arabs that want to be the stooges of the Soviet Union, yeah, of course you want to be, you want to have help from the West. I go back to, if that is true. Yeah, and also, what are we talking about here? These are all, these are all, um, uh, do we remember it? Hold on, what was the word for it? One day, no, we won't. No, we might. Fuck, it's in there. Hold on, it's on the tip of my brain. The names of the, uh, what do they call, what were the names of the provinces of the Ottoman Empire? Du it was, it's not ducats. Fuck. I'm not gonna remember it. I think it was Islets. Somebody said that in chat. Or wait. The administrative divisions. Were they Islets? But regardless, regardless of what they were called. Yeah, the Ottoman Empire, well known for its anti-imperialism. Like, why would you even say? Yeah, uh, it's also buzzwords. Also, notice the buzzwords. France on a military operation. Imperial stooge. Imperial stooge. Imperial imperialism. Imper Bro, it was the Ottoman Empire. How do you think they got that big? What the fuck? Do you think they were making peaceful deals? Come on, what the fuck. And also friends with the Soviet unions. How do you think they got their shit? An interesting argument that Begin made in a whole bunch of leaked classified documents. I, I read all this shit off stream. But it was um, when Begin was negotiating with, I think it was initially talking to Carter and then it was somebody later on when they were trying to figure out what peace with Egypt would look like. And people were talking about like, oh, well, you know, you conquered this land in war and it's not okay and blah, blah, blah. And one of Begin's responses was like, oh, well, it seems like that just kind of is what happens, right? Isn't that how the Soviet Union, for instance, acquired Poland? Isn't that how the Soviet Union like expanded a lot of their territory? It seems strange that all of a sudden it's a huge problem when we're doing it. And it's like, okay, yeah, true. Like you've got the backing of the Soviet Union, one of the largest world powers of imperialism. And then they were, and these are people that came from the Ottoman Empire, which was a literal fucking caliphate, which is a fucking Muslim imperialist thing okay like how are you gonna sit here and say like israel imperialism bro come on it's such a stupid it's such a buzzword to throw around here that it, like everybody is come on dump sorry but then the question again i go back to if that is true if ben Gurion, if the early uh israel saw themselves as a western fashion nation how could we possibly imagine that they would have engaged in the transfer of some 400,000 Arabs after accepting the partition plan? Would that not have completely and totally destroyed their legitimacy in the eyes of the entire Western world? No. Would it not have been? How not? If you With more time to think about it, do you really think Muin is a better interlocutor or just more emotionally stable so people give him more grace? No. Muin is a billion times, yes, he is a better interlocutor than Norm. Even though we would have disagreed, and I do disagree with a lot of him, he at least he has like a brain that is able to hear what the other person... Muin is the only guy that gave like responses. Dr. Avi pointed this out in his post. He gives responses based on what you say. Norm doesn't. Norm is like a, like a music box and you just kind of like spin it around and, it, and you, yeah, and it just plays and that's it. Muin will at least like be able to respond to the things that you say, even if I disagree with what he says. I thought the US and the UK would object at any point to naked barbarism against Palestinians, then the past several months should have thoroughly disabused you of this notion. What? The past several months? Why would you compare the world now to the world of the 1930s and 40s? What the fuck? That might be the dumbest fucking comparison I've ever heard about anything in my entire fucking life. In barbarism against Palestinians, then the past several months should have thoroughly disabused you of this notion. The idea that Israel and its allies are always operating with good intentions is also- They're not! Who said- No one has ever said that, ever! I don't even think Benny would take that position. No, Benny wouldn't take that position. That's not his- Nobody has taken this position, ever! Incredibly apparent in how incredulous Benny Morris and Destiny both are at the notion- Your research, I've seen you go from neutral slash apathetic uh, to leaning, and now it's black and white. I know your debate interlocutors are annoying, but if devil's advocate, is there no strong case? I'm not black and white on anything. What are you talking about? Go listen to my debate with uh, Simchak. Simchan Rockman? What was the guy's name? Oh no, Simcha Rockman? Richmond. No. Yes. Richmond? Simcha. No, fuck. What was this guy's name? Oh, I should know it. Rothman. Rockman. Rothman, same thing, yeah. No, I debated this guy. This guy is a super, super, super far right. 
or you can't say far right. Apparently far right translates to something really bad in Hebrew. So when you say far right in English, I kept getting confused why he kept correcting me. And he's like, oh, I'm not far right. But apparently it means something different. Some guy emailed me this in, in Hebrew when it translates. So they don't like hearing far right in English or something, but. No, there's definitely like a second side to this. But right now, like in my world, in the West, it's like all pro-Palestinian, so that's all you see me argue. But I do fight, um, I will fight with Zionists. Listen, I've said it and I will say it over and over again, okay? If October 7th happened to the West Bank, all right? I'd be tweeting out in support of Hamas, okay? My, don't mistake my positions, please, okay? Daily reminder for any crazy pro-Zionists that are in chat, all right? Daily reminder. Israel would intentionally talk I feel like you knew more facts than Finkelstein, but you could have slowed it down a bit. 99% of the audience probably got lost because you were thinking three steps ahead for every argument. Well, I'm trying to get out my stuff pretty quickly. Hold on, a couple things. One, I'm trying to get out my stuff pretty quickly because I'm getting interrupted constantly. I want to say probably like 30% of my speaking time was on top of Norm because he was speaking over me for the entirety of my answer, which I think is telling, by the way. Um, also, two, I don't think I have more facts than Finkelstein. Uh, just statistically, probabilistically, there's no way. And the way that he speaks sometimes, it does feel like Norm has background information. He just hardcore cherry picks to an unimaginable level. Like, unbelievably target civilians. Now, you would be very familiar with arguments that were proffered in that. <laughs> Sorry, fuck. It's so hard not to be evil. It's so hard not to be evil. Saying you don't belong in this kind of debate would be the same as saying her husband, Kyle, doesn't belong in debates like this. Th that is y'all's job, the fuck? Kind of. I mean, like, I am, and I, by the way, I also acknowledge in the debate, I am very, very, very far behind in terms of scholarship for the three people here. The funny thing is, this is one of the reasons, by the way, why I was also being so couched in the, in the, in the first trials of the debate. If Norm would have slowed way the fuck down I think Norm had the opportunity to actually embarrass me in that debate because Norm almost for sure has read more documents and knows more accounts, even not speaking Hebrew. I'm sure Norm has the information in there. Just by virtue of the fact that he's written so many books about it, even if he's misrepresenting it, like keep in mind, okay, not only did I do a lot of homework for this debate, I also got quite lucky. I got quite lucky that he just happened to be stumbling into the things that I had had specific knowledge about. So for instance, that beach wharf incident where he's saying like, oh, four kids were killed for no reason. I just happened to have read about that particular piece of misinformation that he was citing. Or the ICJ case, I just had decided like the previous night, fuck it, I'm going, I will read through this entire thing instead of, because I had a couple of cliff noted versions of it before, I'm gonna read the entire thing down. Um, I'm gonna be familiar with these quotes. I do know what the UN said about the Great March of Return because this is one of the things that I specifically read through the entire, like he just happened to stumble into things that I knew about. Uh, well, I'll give myself a little bit of credit. I did know more because I was trying to read. But like, it is possible that if he would have been calm in that debate and had gone through more and more, he could have gotten into things that I was completely and totally fucking clueless about. And he would have made me look like a child, but he didn't because he decided to conduct himself like an actual fucking Im imbecile. That section of the debate, essentially both of them argued that if civilians are killed, then they must have been human shields or at the very worst, they were regrettably killed due to the one-off actions of a few rogue soldiers. Such atrocities could not possibly- You could have leaned on Benny in that case though. Maybe, I don't, I don't know how much Benny even knows or cares to fight on current stuff because I feel like this is the feeling that I had from the, the debate and rewatching. I don't know if Benny would have fought on those four Palestinian kids getting blown up by Israel. I feel like he kind of jumped onto my argument as I started to push back on that. It feels like, um, and I talked to Benny a lot about this again the day before. Benny doesn't seem to care as much about like modern day stuff or like international law. He's just not, he, he lives and breathes the, 19, the early 1900s, um, late 19th century, early 20th century. This is like where Benny thrives. Like modern contemporary political stuff, he doesn't care as much about. Um, not because he thinks it's irrelevant or unimportant, it's just, it's just not his area of expertise. Be the result of official Israeli government policy. Of course, a look at the evidence renders this view absurd. After October 7th, the Israeli defense minister announced to the world a top down policy of. It's actually what's weird. If Norma dropped the ad hums and focused on calm debate with destiny, he could have either gotten a few wins or at least given a better debate. Yeah, or he probably could have countered because I'm only arguing. Every argument I've given, I think, is a level one argument because there are counters to every single thing I said. 
And then there are counter counters and we could have gotten really deep into it. Like for instance, when I bring up the fact that in Lausanne, um, the Jews were willing to accept either annexing Gaza of 200,000 people or accepting some huge number of immigrants, there was also a lot of internal chatter about if they would actually accept it. And even Shalom ben Ami says that like Israel would offer these things, but they'd only offer them knowing that the Arabs would reject them out of hand so that it would give them politically the upper hand. These are really valid counter talking points you could have brought up to me and Norm could have pushed on these and said, okay, Stephen, well, if the Jews were really keen to accept this, why wouldn't they have made this deal that they know would have been easier to accept? Why wouldn't they have reached out and talked to the Jordanian king more who was actually more warm to them and tried to work out something um, that would have been acceptable? Why is it that they seemed more keen to aim themselves or orient themselves towards more Western uh, alliances, which Ben Gurion, by the way, explicitly had said he wanted to do for all of his decades of prime ministership and leading Israel? Like, obviously, they're going to present deals to the Arabs that they know that, they, right? These are our, these are valid counter arguments you could have given me. And Norm probably could have done it better than I could have done it because he knows in detail all of these things more. And potentially, depending on how deep some of those conversational threats go, I could be floundering by the end because I don't know all of the details to every single conversation and every single leaked cable and every single leaked paper. Like, I just wouldn't, whereas Norm might have actually read all of this. But yeah, but he didn't, so we didn't even get. But also, I will say also too, I wouldn't have minded that because I am going into this debate really far behind. And if I come out with a whole bunch of surface level or level one, level two, level three talking points, and then like actual scholars give me like the level four, five, six talking points. I'm like, okay, well, fuck me. I do need to do more research. So I would have been okay coming out of that. Being like, I mean, yeah, these guys know way more than me. Fuck it. Like I'll, I'll go do research and figure out if I feel like this is a good point or not. But yeah, he didn't do that. If he was smart, he could have quizzed you on niche stuff until you couldn't answer and everyone would have been like, look how outmatched he is by his by the scholar. I This is the one part that makes me think that maybe it is possible that Norm doesn't have as much information as I think. And that's because Norm did try to quiz me on niche stuff, but he did it four hours into the debate. And when it, it's when he started to scream at me, asking me what chapter six of the UN uh, charter was. You're like, Do you know chapter six? What is chapter six? Do you know chapter seven? What? And that made me think, wait, is this the only thing that you know about in depth? Does that mean you didn't have like deep knowledge of everything before? And this is the one thing that you might be familiar with and this is what you're trying to lean in on? Like. Yeah, I'm not sure, I don't know. Complete siege of the civil- It would be interesting to destiny to debate the pro-Palestine side. I can, I can throw me up any Zionist, I'll, I can debate pro-Palestine perfectly well. After October 7th, the Israeli defense minister announced to the world a top-down policy of complete siege of the civilian population. That collective punishment has continued to a sufficient extent that children are now literally starving to death. And Gaza is now the site. They are wrong about that UN resolution binding bullshit too. Yeah, the reality is I just don't think a resolution being binding. I just don't think that means much. It's not like there's like a checkbox where it's like binding or non-binding. Like, I don't think that binding technically means that much. I think what binding, I think that, I think that what binding means, we should do more reading into the UN. I think that what binding means is either you've created a new rule or regulation. So like the UN is saying that now this is like a new part of the UN rule or I don't even know it wouldn't go into the charter, but it's some new rule or regulation has been created or somebody is making a resolution such that they are, if you deny this or if you break this, now your shit is getting fucked. People are gonna invade you, people are gonna sanction you, people are gonna fuck your shit up. I think that for the Security Council stuff, that's usually under chapter seven. Um, UN resolutions under chapter six only obligate the parties to peacefully resolve things and they don't obligate anybody to military action. So any resolution done under uh, chapter six, even for the Security Council, like it'll be there and they'll say, do these things, but nobody's gonna like fuck you up if you don't do them. So that's kind of like non-binding. And then um, it, they, they didn't actually spell out anything in particular about the, um, they didn't spell out anything particular in resolution 242. There's like nothing, nothing particular is even expressed in there. So it's like, what are we even being bound to? Binding for what? What are we? He said multiple times that he read the material you were talking about at various points and couldn't remember any of it when pressed. You should go to a neurologist. Yeah. YouTube channel Soha has an Israeli dude who served on the IDF and argues pro-Palestinian and pro-Israel perspectives on his channel. He has a lot of connections to orgs on the ground that you and Luna Barks, he was going to go there. Wow. Are you going to go over Don Lemon after this? Yeah, we'll watch that. Of the worst levels of acute hunger in the entire world. This, in and of itself, disproves the fantasy that Israeli governments would never target civilians intentionally. That's to say nothing of the vast destruction and death toll, which is inconsistent with the view that the problem of civilian casualties is simply the result of a few bad apples. The entire Gaza Strip population has clearly been targeted. Now, in the debate, Moeen Rabani does a phenomenal job of identifying this massive blind spot and hypocrisy when it comes to the judgment of Israeli or Western actions versus Palestinian actions. This particular section- Oh, he's gonna do, this is the quote where he's like, you've just discovered morality. Moeen is a good speaker. That's a good line, by the way. 
do with documented Israeli atrocities committed against civilians in Lebanon. Take a listen. It sounds cold to say it, but war is tragic and civilians die. There is no war. Please, please review Sabi Sabs. Norm Fegelstein demolishes destiny. It's the most disturbing shit I've ever seen in this debate. She believes you're being paid off. And the camera the fact that Hamas has rejected multiple ceasefires in exchange for the hospital? No, because they'll just say, no, actually, Hamas is willing to, um, 47 minutes. There's no way we're watching all of this. Because they'll say, no, um, Hamas is offering ceasefires. It's just in exchange for a total and complete and total ceasefire and then, like, a two-state solution and, like, everything. Like, yeah. <clears throat> Do you think you did better here or against Shapiro? Um... They're two totally different styles of argue, com conversation. I think I did better here. This is the most proud conversation I've ever had in my entire life. It seems like it's not, and it seems like it whatever, and I understand why not. But um, the um, yeah, this was a lot of reading and prep, more than I've ever done, probably for almost every single topic combined in my entire life. Honestly, I didn't read a whole book on fucking Ukraine Russia. I didn't read any books on immunology. Um, so I would say yeah, just because of the amount of prep time that went into all of this, that this has not happened in in the history of all of humankind. Can you clarify your position on the Zionist settlers? You defended them pretty hard in your debate, but you also said you wouldn't give a, wait, when did I defend settlers in, in the debate? Are you talking about in the initial formation of the state of Israel or? The statement that Israel might take care not to target civilians is not incompatible with a diary entry from someone who said they saw civilians getting killed. I think that sometimes we do a lot of weird games when we talk about international humanitarian law or laws that govern conflict, but we say things like civilians dying is a war crime or civilian homes or hospitals getting destroyed is necessarily a war crime or is necessarily somebody intentionally targeting civilians without making distinctions between military targets or civilian ones. I think that when we analyze different attacks or when we talk about the conduct of a military, I think it's important to understand uh, it, like prospectively from the unit uh, of analysis of the actual- I need, I I think I should have like explained, maybe I need to explain all of this more. When you're doing an analysis of militaries, find out if they're conducting themselves good or not, uh, or, or with goodness, or in compliance or comporting with international law, I should say, I guess. Um, you, the, the analysis needs to be perspective, meaning that we look at what they knew at the time and then we go from there. You can't retrospectively analyze the situation to see if somebody acted good or bad. You've got to do it with the information available at the time, right? Like a simple example of this is, if you're holding um, two cards to a flush in your hand and there's three cards to a flush on the board and you know somebody decides to, or I'm sorry, so there's two to a flush on the board. I don't even remember any of my poker odds. 30, is it like 37% to make it by the river? If there's two on the board, one, uh, two in your hand? If somebody pushes you all in and you've got odds, the odds are in your favor based on the pot to bet, and you bet and you go all in, whether or not you win or lose the hand is irrelevant. What matters is if you made a good call at the time. You don't, you don't evaluate, it, when you play poker, you don't evaluate whether you made a good or bad decision based on the outcome of the hand. The outcome is irrelevant. Um, it, it's funny because in a lot of ways when you're evaluating you're playing poker, the results you can't be results oriented in, in a in a singular hand, in a discrete hand. Now, in a volume, obviously, you'd look at um, whether or not you're winning or losing at a certain stake. Sorry, yeah, but you, you have to look at the information you got available to you at the time. That's what I'm trying to explain. Yeah. Military committing the acts, what's happening and what are the decisions yeah. being made, rather than just saying retrospectively, oh, well, a lot of civilians died, not very many you know, military people died, comparatively speaking, so uh, it must have been war crimes, especially when you've got another side, um, I'll fast forward to Hamas, that intentionally attempts to induce those same civilian numbers, because Hamas is guilty of- Somebody emailed me, or I saw this on a subreddit post or something, and um, it's such a good point. And the, I think a killer question here, I think a killer question here is, can we all agree that Israel has taken things to protect the Gazan population? Even if you don't think it's enough, can we at least agree they did things? They did drop leaflets, they did drop, um, they did do phone calls. Even if we agree it's not enough, they did give the warning, right? So Israel has taken steps to protect the Gazan population. Has Hamas taken a single step to protect their own population? Even one. one, one step, not even a single step to protect their own population. So of course you're gonna wind up in this situation. Hold on, I got strips that prevent the air noise. I'm gonna put it under this door, hold on, I think. Hey, like no one ever responds to the most ethical such moral army argument. Any idea why that is? Because it kind of breaks the narrative. Of 
any war crime that you would potentially accuse, and this is according to Amnesty International, people that Norm loves to cite, Hamas is guilty of all of these same war crimes, of them failing to take care of the civilian population, of them essentially utilizing human shields to try to fire rockets free from attack. Essentially. Um, I like how, God, I was so ready to fight on this point. And he brings this up, because essentially, because I know that in Amnesty International, they explicitly say that Hamas doesn't use human shields. However, the definition that Amnesty International uses for human shields does not comport with any international understanding of what human shields are. And Norm has quoted these exact same bad definitions of human shielding, where Amnesty International, at least in 2014 and 2008, and Norm Finkelstein seems to think that human shields only require you to intentionally direct around civilian populations, which is inconsistent with the um, with international humanitarian law rules around human shielding. I was so ready for him to fight me on this, and he just, he said this one word, and then he didn't even bother to engage. I, said I would have asked Mo Modi Moini? about October 7th. If you were in charge of Israel's defense on October 7th, would you have sent them in to stop the Hamas raid? Well, of course he would stop the raid, but he just wouldn't attack after. It's probably what he would say, right? Wow, Juzmin. Thanks to the five gifted subs, buddy. Civilian population of them essentially utilizing human shields to try to fire rockets free from attack. Essentially? Um, essentially, yes. If, uh, as in, I'm just saying that essentially, yeah. as in terms of how- I should have let him fight me here instead of offering up the explanation. Oh, no, never mind. That's fine. Whatever. Law defines it. not how Amnesty International defines it, but Amnesty International describes times of human shielding, but they don't actually apply the correct international legal don't standard. Know what's the correct I know absolutely. So we could have argued about it here. This is, I'm, I didn't, because I'm expecting like he's going to bring up the argument, but he's not. He's just going to ad hominem me again. He should have just brought up the argument. Give me one example of Hamas directing civilians to a military objective, and then we could have argued over that. But he doesn't. He just ad hominem the fuck out of me. You no, have to. No, no, I absolutely. You have to. I absolutely. I, I, I think, but, um, but I'm just saying. Wikipedia. I'm just saying. I'm just you saying. Believe it or not, Norm, the entire Geneva Convention is all on Wikipedia. It's a wonderful okay, website. You know but I'm just saying. I'm just saying that on the Hamas side, there's an attempt to induce this type of military activity, attempt to induce civilian harm. That is not just enough to say like, well, here's a diary entry where a guy talks about how tragic. See, I think the problem. Are. I think the problem with, with, with your statement. I wonder if they'll even give us one thing, or if it's just going to do the discovered morality, and they'd be like, God, they owned him. Is that, if you go back and listen to it, the first part of it is, war is hell, civilians die. It's, it's a fact of life. And, and, and you state that in a very factual matter. Then when you start talking about Hamas, all of a sudden you've discovered morality, and you've discovered condemnation, and you've discovered intent. Moeen, <laughs> what is this? That's not, a, that's not an argument. That's a slogan. What? We bodied him there. When is Hamas? The bad intent. Oh, he bought, he destroyed him. You've discovered condemnation and you've discovered intent. Muin absolutely bodied him there. When is Hamas? The bad intent is assumed. Destiny has zero trouble calling their actions war crimes. When it's Israel, war is hell. And the default assumption is that they were trying to achieve legitimate military objectives and the civilians just got in the way. But double standards and hypocrisy are not the only way of denying Israel is committing war crimes. When left with no other options, one can simply deny basic reality. Here is Benny Morris resorting to this tactic when confronted with the starvation of Palestinians. As of today, one quarter of the population of Gaza is starving. That means 500,000 children <laughs> are starving. Are on the verge of famine. They keep saying on the verge of. On the verge of I have not. I have not seen. I have not seen one Palestinian ago? die of starvation in these last four months. Well, not one. There have They're been always documented on the verge. Cases. They're on the verge. There have been documented cases. I haven't of, seen of, them. Yesterday, Al Jazeera said six, and the day before. I shouldn't have even given this. Why am I even offering? Why am I helping them? I don't think either of these two knew that on this day when the debate was taking place, Al Jazeera reported six children starved to death, and the day before there had been two children. Now, whether these are all cerebral palsy people or whatever, I'm not sure. I don't know if I take these reports seriously, but Al Jazeera had reported these two things. But I don't think either of them even knew it. I shouldn't have even offered this up. I don't know why the fuck I even said this. I should have let them fucking flounder. They're it's always on the verge. Cases. They're on the verge. There have been documented cases. I haven't of, seen of, them. Yesterday, Al Jazeera said six, and the day before that, they said two. So those are the, okay. the two. This, that, that and, now, and why am I countering Benny here? I hung him out to dry. I'm a shitty, I am a shitty debate partner here. I am an asshole. Fuck me. There probably dies you're, in Israel of starvation also. So I, I don't think there's famine so in Israel. Back. There isn't. There isn't in the Gaza Strip you're either. So it's something so which is... Day. Produced for the Western. There, there, there are infants dying due to a engineered lack of access to food and nutrition. I don't think it's engineered. I think the Hamas stopped shooting, perhaps. Or, what, or, as you uh, said, is there any chance of Austin appearing on Kick or Keep? No. That engineered. I think um, Amnesty, and, excuse me, Human Rights Watch called it using starvation as a weapon. That's called engineering. Yes, congrats. Yes, you are the master of living in in six word quotes. Congratulations, Norm. You've um, you've deployed another. Ah, oh, another, another short quote. Oh no. Benny Morris claimed there, I have not seen one Palestinian die of starvation. 
maybe you need to spend some more time on TikTok where you might get actually information versus whatever propaganda networks you are currently being fed from. Did yes. she really uh, unironically just say that? <laughs> where you might get actually information versus whatever propaganda networks you are currently being fed from. Yes, Palestinian children and infants are dying of starvation. Yes. It is because of an intentional. I still do, I'm still not actually sure that's true. Like I said, I saw a couple of stories in Al Jazeera. I don't know if they're true or not because a lot of people are challenging a lot of these. It's like this is a kid with cerebral palsy. He's not actually starving to death. It looks like his body's weird because he has a disease. It's not. Yeah, you know, but I'm, I don't know 100 percent. Series of Israeli policies. In fact, Oxfam, as we discussed before, just released a new report detailing the many methods that Israel is using to intentionally starve Palestinians. Oh, another one. Oxfam, Israel. Block aid response. That one guy, the, um, I wanna call him Norman Robinson. Robin, Nathan Robinson. He linked me that thing and I went through this on stream and they, apparently they had people on the ground and they did a whole bunch of investigation, blah, blah. I didn't see a single thing in there about like Israel blocking aid. Maybe there's something in this one. Let's, let's read. International community uh, resorts to sea routes and airdrops rather than challenge Israel for systematically undermining unfettered, unfettered access of relief. Wait. Why would you expect it to be unfettered when there's a terrorist entity or there's a government in the, in the, in the region that is hijacking relief? Yeah, I don't think Modi would have actually said that he'd repeal the raid. You mean Moini? Are we mispronouncing his name on purpose? He was trying to imply the 400 civilians were hit by idea friendly fire. Oh. Israeli authorities have rejected a warehouse full of international aid, including oxygen, incubators, and Oxfam water and sanitation gear, all of which is now stockpiled at Al Arish, just 40 kilometers away from the border of 2.3 million desperate Palestinians in Gaza. 40 kilometers away? That sounds really far. It, this is a small place. Why is it so far away? What? Well, let's find out. I don't know. Maybe it's not. How far away is... Um... What's the thing to draw a ruler? Why don't I have the things popping up? This map was created by a user. Right click. Okay, well, cringe. Gaza map, who the fuck, why are these people like creating their own maps? Okay, whatever, fuck it. Might be the nearest warehouse? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. The aid originates from many humanitarian organizations of the world and has been rejected over weeks and months as a result of an unpredictable and chaotic regime of approval, scanning and inspection, ultimately controlled by Israeli authorities. The reasons for rejection are not clear, says Oxfam. Okay, well, we published some stuff about this. This is all so vague. In a new report today, okay, we've got another, okay, maybe there's something more in here. Inflicting unprecedented suffering destruction. Seven ways the government of Israel is deliberately blocking and are undermining the international military response in the Gaza. Okay, we've got actual things. Um, what are these European writing styles? Christ. March 15th, four days ago. Under international humanitarian law and occupying power bears significant responsibilities towards the occupied population, including ensuring protection, maintaining blah, 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 okay, blah. It's a famine, especially in northern Gaza. Stands by an overwhelming majority not having access to clean water. No, 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 no. Okay. In this briefing, we outlined seven fundamental humanitarian access constraints. One, a total military siege amounting to collective punishment. Israel, okay, this is nothing. Two, an unjustifiably inefficient process of inspection protocols. Aid is being kept snarled up and red. Okay. Maybe they're gonna go more into it in detail below. Arbitrary rejections of dual-use items. Israeli authorities routinely refuse life-saving aid from convoys through random decisions, often due to their opaque use of its pres prescribed dual-use list. Decimation, destruction, and disruption. Attacks on aid workers. The process of notification systems or deconfliction or protection from military attacks of civilian and humanitarian assets is not respected and untrustworthy. Humanitarian workers, convoys, and aid assets like warehouses and storage sites and guest houses, as well as life-saving civilian infrastructure like hospitals have been targeted and attacked. Okay. 
It's full siege on the already besieged under which no food, water, medicines, electricity. And December 9, more than two months ago, Israeli authorities approved the partial reopening of the Karem Abu Salem commercial crossing. This has not served the purpose intended of meaningfully and effectively increasing the entry of aid into Gaza. Okay, on December 21st, an Israeli airstrike targeted the Karem Abu Salem border crossing area in southern Gaza, killing the director responsible for coordinating humanitarian aid entry. The director of, like, all of it? Let's check this out. 21st. Also, this is old as fuck. It's not going to be anything new, is it? It's just going to be the same 97% of water. It's going to be the same shit over and over again. Why does it keep getting published over and over again like there's some new shit? Um, 21st December, Israeli air strikes south. I'm just curious what this one strike is. It sounds kind of bad. If you're killing, if like a aid director. December 21, Israeli air strike, Karem Abu Salem. Kills Palestinian border crossing chief. Okay, an Israeli air raid has killed a Palestinian border crossing director in southern Gaza. According to Palestinian officials in Hamas, Bassem Gaben, the director of the Israeli controlled uh, Karem Abu Salem crossing called Karem Shalom in Israel, was killed along with three other people by Israeli fire. Gaza Health and Border Authority said on Thursday he had been working to facilitate the flow of humanitarian aid into the enclave through the crossing, which happened on Friday. So the attack showed the Israelis not only targeting infrastructure homes, but also places the Palestinians. Lie on for humanitarian aid, they need for survival. Uh, Israel's military indicated that it was not involved in the Karem Abu Salem attack, saying it was not familiar with the incident. Um, this, Israel's military will sometimes say this, and then a week or so later, we'll be like, oh shit, actually we were involved in that. Um, Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye. <sighs> okay. The crossing located on the southern tip of Gaza bordering Israel has been approved to temporarily reopen on Friday to increase... Okay, previously... Okay. All right, wait. Okay, hold on. This said on December 21st, this was an Israeli airstrike. Um, I'm sorry. Hold on. I'm not trying to sound condescending because I, I legitimately don't know. I thought when you said airstrike, I thought that implies air to surface attacks. Would you consider like a mortar fire or even like a missile, like surface to surface, would that be considered an airstrike? Airstrike is exclusively air to ground, right? Okay. So this says on December 21st, an Israeli airstrike targeted the border crossing. So this, if they don't know if it's Israel or Hamas, then it sounds like it wasn't an airstrike. And then this says that,
um, the director of the Israeli control was killed along with three other people by Israeli fire. That makes it sound like it was a gunfight. So is it an airstrike or was it gunfire? These two things are very, 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 very different things. Fire can be fires like artillery? Sure, but even artillery wouldn't be considered an airstrike. They are interchangeable terms. Airstrike and artillery strike are interchangeable? It says air raid right above it. An Israeli air raid has killed a Palestinian border crossing director uh, in southern Gaza, according to Palestinian officials in Hamas. Oh, okay, never mind. An air raid killed by Israeli fire. How is there a question of whether or not it was Israel or Hamas then? Or how is it a question of who did it? Wouldn't you just, wouldn't you see the planes? Or do they fire these things from like dozens of miles away? I don't know like what the range is on air to surface. This was published on the 21st. Is this not overly pedantic? Okay. When you're building a narrative about somebody, when you tell a billion little lies, it amounts to something much larger. So am I being pedantic right now? I'm not being pedantic, I'm being precise, okay? When you read this, on, the Dece on December 21st, an Israeli airstrike targeted a border crossing area in southern Gaza, killing the director responsible for coordinating humanitarian aid entry, okay? The, what's created in a person's mind is that, first of all, it sounds like there is one person whose job is to coordinate humanitarian aid. That's one thing here. And then it sounds like an Israeli airstrike targeted the border crossing area and killed this person. That's, the, that's what's being left with you. You, that's the impression that the average person gets by reading this. So to say you're being pedantic to, to have the phrasing on this be exactly correct, especially when they're not providing a source to, to the story. No, I don't think it's pedantic. I think it's called being precise. And I think there's a good reason to be precise. Um, this is an Al Jazeera article claiming that there is an air raid. This guy was killed by Israeli fire. I'm guessing by Israeli fire is referring to the air raid and not like a subsequent firefight or something, I guess. Israel's military said they weren't involved with it. Do we, we just don't know? Or... Also, it sounds like this was a guy that was working the border crossing. Not that that makes it good or bad or, or any better or whatever was a border crossing director. This makes it sound like he's like a humanitarian aid worker. Israeli fire makes it sound like they did a strafing run with a cannon. Yeah, that sound, yeah. Like, I'm curious, do we actually know if this is true? So we'll go, you got, there's 10,000 people here. Go, my minions. Twenty-first, twenty-first, twenty-first. Four Palestinians killed in Israeli airstrike near Rafa. An Israeli airstrike killed a senior border official and three others in Rafa. Hamas and health officials said the newswire said Israel's military has indicated it was not involved. Hamas and health officials said that Colonel Bassam Gaben, director of the Karm Abu Salim commercial crossing between Israel and Gaza, and three other Palestinians were killed, asked for comment. An Israeli military spokesperson said, we checked this, and it's not an incident that's familiar to us. Now, just remember, just because they're saying that they weren't involved, they could have been, although usually they'll say it like a week or two after, or at least I've seen that before. Do we, do we know? Does this mean this guy was a colonel in Hamas? Well, that would be another question, but it, maybe you use military people to regulate like border crossings. I'm, I'm being charitable there, I'm, I'm, maybe.
The attack shows that the Israeli military was targeting routes relied on for the entry of much needed aid to the enclave. NewArab.com. We don't have any cell phone footage. We don't have any videos. We don't have any more precise information. Hamas says Israeli strike killed border official. The article said the guy was a colonel. That doesn't sound like just a humanitarian worker. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be a little, a little charitable. Okay, I don't know. Rocket sirens sounded Thursday in central and southern Israel, while, Ham while Hamas militants in the Gaza Strip said an Israeli airstrike killed four people in southern Gaza. Hamas said those killed included um, Bosom government, the Hamas-appointed senior border official, the Gaza side of the Karom Shalom crossing. The Reuters news agency quoted an Israeli military spokesman saying Israel is not familiar with the incident. Even weirder is that this crossing is controlled, is an Israeli controlled crossing. Well, but there's a Palestinian side too, right? History and incidents. Oh, this is where that one guy was captured in 2006. Was captured by Hamas militants near Karim Shalom after the attackers infiltrated the border under the or from the Gaza Strip in Israel via tunnel. In 2008, Palestinian suicide bombers detonated their explosive laden vehicles at the crossing. In 2012, the crossing was attacked by a group of masked gunmen who had killed 16 police officers and hijacked armored jeeps from an Egyptian border checkpoint. One jeep, apparently booby-trapped, rammed the checkpoint and exploded. The other was destroyed by the Israeli Air Force. 2018, Hamas tunnels into Israel. The IAF planes demolished a terror tunnel that passed under the Karom Shalom crossing. In 2018, Palestinian riders set part of the Karom Shalom crossing ablaze three times. 2019, rocket attacks. Israeli authorities closed the crossing for a week in response to renewed Palestinian rocket attacks launched from Gaza against Israel. 2023, in May of 2023, during Gaza-Israel clashes, Palestinian Islamic Jihad launched dozens of rockets at the Karom Shalom and Erez crossings. The crossings were shuttered after Israel launched Operation Shield and Air in response. 2023, it was one of several targets attacked by Hamas as part of a coordinated multi front. Wait, hold on. Wait, why do we think this was attacked by Israel? Do we have any reason to think this at all right now, aside from a Hamas spokesperson said this? The crossing had been scheduled to be closed during that day's um, Simchat Torah holiday, other than for humanitarian and medical supplies. The crossing was the first closed during the ensuing IDF operations, the 22nd of October. The IDF apologized for accidentally firing and hitting an Egyptian post adjacent to the border area. The crossing was reopened for UN aid trucks on the 17th of December in order to abide by an agreement made by the hostage prisoner exchange with 100 trucks being, donated, being allowed through daily to aid the, the 100 permitted uh, X base canister donated by the Netherlands throughout 2023, although aid trucks. Uh, So there's just, there's literally no evidence of the, ugh, okay. Okay, I'm good. Um, that includes blocking it entirely, using a, an arbitrarily bureaucratic and restrictive process to block the aid, indiscriminately targeting civilians, including aid workers, rendering distribution impossible. In the face of these undeniable facts, which are too awful to defend without resorting to outright Nazi rhetoric, the only option left is just to flat out deny reality. There's no other choice if you're committed to painting Israel. What's going to happen if this war continues for another three months and ends and you have another situation where nobody starved to death or nobody died of starvation? Like, what do we do? Like. As a moral actor. For his part, Destiny was inclined to pull from the debate bro playbook in order to distract and attempt to put Norm and Moeen both on the defensive. One of these tactics was on display as the debate participants argued over whether or not Israel is in fact committing genocide. Now, in this section, Destiny attempted to throw up a smokescreen of complexity to, number one, try to make it appear as if Norm's correct interpretation of the ICJ finding was wrong, thereby dodging the actual implication of that international court's ruling that the South African case alleging genocide was in fact plausible, and two, in order to make the question of genocide seem so complex and technical. 
that no layperson could possibly understand it, and you're a fool to even try. I mean, it is complex and technical. Yes, that's why you have like an international court that rules on these. What do you mean? It's not just like a thing that you see it and it's obvious. Yeah, it's an incredibly technical thing. I you also get to enjoy some of Norm's unbridled contempt for destiny in this exchange. Take a look. They even make it to plausible. That is not true. Even, that is not it's what plausible means. High, it is absolutely right. not. You're Mr. dead Borelli, wrong. Mr. Borelli, please don't teach me about the English language. So the declaration said, is not even about the English language. It's about legal standards. This sentence here doesn't even make sense. Talk about English language, bro. I Point said plausibility is, not is the same in the concept phase, as qualifying. The court is not asked at this present phase of the proceedings to determine whether South Africa's allegations of genocide Didn't are well-founded. They're not uh, well-founded. They're not even well-founded. The court I, is, you said that plausible is a I, high I, standard. It's absolutely I, not. It is uh, a misrepresentation of the strength of the case against Israel, just like the majority not, of the quotes they have every, in this case are. And also, you okay. said it was an extremely well-founded case. They spend like one-fourth of all of the quotations, some even pulled from the Goldstone report, that try to, uh, uh, that actually deal with the intent part. Mm -hmm. and, which is, by the way, I think you guys, I don't know if you use the phrase, the dolo specialis, that the intentional part of genocide. Sorry, I don't know the, that the, term. The, 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 I, think it's, I think it's called dolo specialis. It's the most important part. I shouldn't have doubted myself here. I think it's called, no, it, I can't, I can't believe neither of them have heard this term. This is astounding to me. Of genocide, which is proving the special, there's a highly special intent to commit genocide. It's that's possible that Israel could. That's mens rea. That's not mens rea, you fucking knuckle dragging dipshit. You're so stupid. I can't believe he would say this thinking he's making a good point. I can't believe other people are saying this thinking he's making a good point. No, you fucking retard. No. Oh. The mens rea, they, yes, I understand the state of mind, but the, the, and for genocide, there is. It's called dolo specialis. It's a highly special intent. Did you read the case? Yeah. It shows up in the case four fucking times. He said he read it four fucking times, so he should have seen the term 16 times. Oh, it's a highly special intent, dolo specialis. And if you don't know this obscure legal term, then apparently you can't possibly understand the concept of genocide. Yes, correct. You can't. She just says something that's true in a sarcastic voice like it's not true. Yes, if you don't know what that, and you don't even have to know the fucking, the Latin or whatever, but if you don't know the concept, you're not qualified to even have an idea about genocide. You have no idea. You can't know, you have no idea. It's a neat way for Destiny to dismiss the targeting of civilians, the collective punishment, the direct quotes of high level- None of those things, targeting civilians, none of these things are genocide. They're bad, they're war crimes, they're horrible things. Uh, assuming they've happened with the intent to do these harms to civilians, these are bad things. They're not genocide. Israeli officials admitting their genocidal intent because only oh Destiny God. at the table possesses this super special knowledge and so only he is qualified to judge whether Israel has in fact met the bar of this highly special intent. Now, as our friend Yegor details on uh, Twitter, there is nothing magical about the Latin legal term dolus specialis. It just means specific intent. In other words, you can't accidentally do a genocide. You gotta have specific intent, something that Norm and Wien clearly demonstrate in their comments that they fully understand. Furthermore, there is actually debate, for what it's worth, in the international law community about how such intent can be established, since usually, usually, governments do not go around declaring they are doing a genocide. You don't have to say explicitly that you're doing a genocide, but you still need the evidence there to prove. Why are so many people, I don't understand, there's, I, this came up with the Donald Trump January 6th shit as well. Even Glenn Greenwald tried this. How could you possibly figure out the intentionality of a person? What do you think literally all criminal law in the entirety of the fucking world is built upon? Why are we, and why are we assuming that we cannot figure out the intentionality of any person ever? Every single criminal law, save for statutory crimes, are all of these things require an intent element, a mens rea intentionality to it. Like. It's like, it's like these guys are like, oh, well, if these guys are like a 12 year old who's like, well, if I ever got arrested for murder, I would just go in, LOL. And I would say that uh, skibbity toilet, I was having a psychotic uh, breakdown and I was just like hallucinated. I thought I was dreaming, LOL. And now like Crystal, who's the judge on the case is like, oh fuck, he said he was dreaming. I mean, can we really prove otherwise? Can we really know? Can we really know his intent? Oh my God, he, they've destroyed the entirety of our case by saying he thought he was dreaming. Can you respond to the statements from officials show genocidal intent claim? Um, I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't have a chance to go through every single ICJ quote. Um, I went through, I think four or five of them, but as I was reading down the list of the five that I went through, four of them were horrendously misquoted. And at that point I'm like, this is retarded because in my mind, I'm like, I'm probably not even gonna get to read through like two of these. And I don't even know if I got to read like a single one without knowing to read. So thank God I didn't waste time on that. But um, yeah, the thing is, is that most of these, um, or at least of the ones that I went through, maybe in the net, in the last half or maybe after four or five, maybe all of them are actually rock solid. Supposedly Lonerbox went through all of these and has contentions with most of them. But um, yeah, they're just like, they're, they're wacky and wild.
that there was these were so fucking pathetic. How can that be allowed? I don't know because they do bring up a good point when an international court of justice has saw this and said it was good. I'm I if I could talk to anyone on stream, that would be wild. Um, because unless I'm unless I'm too poisoned on the other side, I'm not. I'm not. Um, like, if I saw even one of these, I, I think I would, it would cause me to second guess everything. So, if I saw, if I saw one of these things, I, I think I would, I would distrust every single thing you have to say after this. I, I wouldn't trust anything. You would be like on a blacklist of this guy is a, is a disinformationer. So here's the quote that's in the ICJ case. Actually, never mind. We're just gonna, I'll just pull it right from the case, okay? Why do people like Crystal uh, think, what do people like Crystal think will happen if Trump wins with his, with the uncommitted voting, Gaza won't give out, who get, they're rich, they're white, they don't give a fuck who wins. Dear Mr. Benelli, concerned about your mental health, hearing excessive pro-Palestinian anti-Israel rhetoric might be more harmful than engaging with MAGA. Oh, good one, fuck you, okay. You have to write these arguments and have them up in Notepad on stream. Well, I mean, I have, they're all in my thing, yeah. Um, do you think that bombing the whole Gaza Strip isn't necessarily a genocide thing? Might be too brain-breaking, inflammatory to the point that we're us? I don't know, I mean, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not sure. Some, there are a few people that understood this, like a couple tweets I saw that got big that understood this. <clears throat> Wait, hello? Um, okay, so here in section D, by the way, they uh, do expressions of genocidal intent against the Palestinian people by Israeli state officials and others. Um, so this is one of the quotes that I had for Herzog. So on October 12th, 2023, President Isaac Herzog made clear that Israel was not distinguishing between militants and civilians in Gaza, okay? So not failure to distinguish, okay, lack of distinction is one of the three most important parts of law of armed conflict, all right? This is a really big deal. You should never, ever be doing this, that we're not gonna distinguish between militants and civilians. So stating in a press conference to foreign media in relation Palestinians in Gaza, typo, I guess, over 1 million of whom are children, I don't know why we keep sticking this in here, it's such a stupid fucking virtue signal, but um, quote, it's an entire nation out there that is responsible. It's not true this rhetoric about civilians not aware, not involved. It's absolutely not true, and we will fight until we break their backbone. So we're saying that Israel is not distinguishing between militants and civilians. That's a big deal. And it seems like in his quote, he's basically saying that the entire nation is responsible, um, and we're going to break their backbone. That's a Pretty extreme statement. That's a really troubling statement. Genocidal, maybe. It's That's pretty bad. But they have the source of these quotes in their own, they have the source of these quotes in their own application. <clears throat> and when you go through and you read what it's quoted from, okay, now remember, okay, Herzog stated in a press conference, they were not distinguishing between militants and civilians in Gaza, all right? <clears throat> President Isaac Herzog and Israel's head of, is Israel's head of state. He spoke on Wednesday about what he called the largest single massacre of Jews uh, since the Holocaust. But when asked about the bombardment of Gaza and the humanitarian situation of civilians, his sadness turned to anger. I asked him what Israel can do to alleviate the impact on the over two million civilians in Gaza, many of whom have nothing to do with Hamas. We are working, operating militarily in terms according to rules of international law, period, unequivocally. Okay, now that seems to contradict this statement, but maybe he just doesn't know the international law, or maybe he'll say that, but really he's saying they're gonna kill all the civilians. It's possible, so, but we're already kind of up to it, but okay. 
It is an entire nation out there that is responsible. It's not true this rhetoric about civilians not aware, not involved, it's absolutely not, not true. Oh, okay, so maybe he is saying that every civilian is a combatant. That's not good. So that is true, he's not distinguishing. But then he says, they could have risen up, they could have fought against that evil regime which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat. Okay, well now this sounds like, he's not saying that they were all responsible necessarily for the attacks on October 7th. He's saying that they could have coup d'etat, but okay. But we are at war, we are defending our homes, we are protecting our homes, that's the truth, and when a nation protects its home, it fights and we will fight until we break their backbone. Okay, well now this is a statement that seems like it has more to do with war than just like killing every civilian, but okay. He acknowledged that many Gazans had nothing to do with Hamas, but was adamant that others did. Well, now this thing, thing seems to completely contradict this lack of distinguishing between militants and civilians, and it seems to completely contradict that the entire nation out there is responsible. Why did we leave this part out? I agree that there are many innocent Palestinians who don't agree with this. But if you have a missile in your goddamn kitchen, you have to shoot it at me. Am I allowed to defend myself? We have to defend ourselves. We have the full right to do so. This is a distinction between military objective and civilian. You cannot have missiles in your kitchen or hide things like that. Um, the, the selective quoting of this, now if you wanna fight and say that maybe this sounds bad or too extreme, fine, but this representation is completely wild. This is an unhinged representation of the underlying material. You can also tell too when something is lying because if he truly, you can really tell, you can really tell as soon as you click through and you read the headline. Like, if he was truly saying, we're not gonna distinguish between civilians and militants anymore, that would be up here. You're not gonna see like, Israeli President Isaac Herzog says Gazans could have risen up to fight evil Hamas. That's, you would, that would be like a headline. On the 15th of October, 2023, echoing the words of Prime Minister Netanyahu, the president told foreign media that we will uproot evil so that there will be good for the entire region and the world. ...with a, a, an extremely cruel, inhumane enemy, which we have to uproot with no mercy. I'll show you another example. We are faced with a, a, an extremely cruel, inhumane enemy, which we have to uproot with no mercy. I'll show you another example. This was found on the body of one of the terrorists. This is a booklet. Okay, this booklet is instruction guide how to go into a... Who is the enemy here? We will uproot evils so that will be good for the entire region of the world. Like, who, who, who are we talking about here? Are you talking about Palestinian civilians? Also, why are we, why are we submitting an application to the goddamn International Court of Justice linking one minute and 30 second f***ing Twitter videos? What the f*** is happening here? Why the f*** are these our, our sources? I feel like I'm reading a fucking Norman Finkelstein book where we've got tweets and news articles as our, as our sourcing for things. We can't go to full sources. We can't get whole transcripts of interviews. We can't get any of this, like at least the full thing, at least the video. Civilian premises into a kibbutz, a city, a moshav, how to break in. And first thing, what do you do when you find the citizens? You torture them. This is the booklet. It says exactly how to torture them, how to abduct them, how to kidnap them. So therefore, the story is not Israel versus Palestinians or Judaism versus Islam, God forbid. The story is about human, humanity. Are we with the good or are we with evil? That's where humanity should stand. And the battle that we are carrying out now as a nation rising up as a lion is, a, is against evil. And we will uproot evil so that there will be good for the entire region and the world. For the last two years, we enabled a huge economic growth in Gaza. For the first time, we enabled tens of thousands of Palestinians from Gaza to work in Israel, to break bread, to enjoy life. What happened? There's no justification. It is simply an ISIS-type ideology that wants to eliminate us off the ground, and therefore they need to be eliminated off the ground. Like, if you want to make the argument that he's specifically referring to civilians or all Palestinians, linking a, linking a one minute, 30 second news thing, where half of this is him talking about a Hamas terrorist book, this is not the argument. This isn't it. 
Um, but anyway, there's there's like a lot of these. Well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. I'm so sorry, I shouldn't say that. I think I went through, there were four of these I think that I found where I felt like, some of these also are, it'll literally be like a 20 second video clip of like a military commander talking. Ah, oh, fuck, I should have saved some of these. My feeling was just that I'll never be able to, um, I'm not even gonna get to read any of these, so. I'm trying to think if they have, did they have the one clip that's incorrectly translated where there is a, uh, there's like a soldier saying that we're gonna kill, or I, I shot and killed students. <laughs> I don't remember if that was included in here or not. Oh, I think it was here. Maybe? No, no, it wasn't. It was in the Soy Noah video? Yeah, I think it was just in the Noah video. Wild of the Twitter is no longer real life. Is this the same video where that, apparently there's a video of it's either this guy or some other old dude talking about how school children would run up to him and he'd just shoot and kill them all or whatever. But the translation in Hebrew, apparently class um, might be describing like a, a class of like students, but in the context is very obviously talking about like a brigade or a, or a regiment or whatever of soldiers. It's referring to like soldiers. Now whether he shot and killed soldiers trying to surrender obviously is not good, but it's um, like the mistranslation is, also egregious. But anyway, regardless, sorry, just without getting all sidetracked on this, the um, the ICJ case, or I'm sorry, the, some of those South African quotes are fucking ridiculous. Many scholars argue that as a result, circumstantial evidence could suffice for proving this specific intent to genocide or dolus specialis if we're being fancy. If it's not fancy, it's what it is. I don't know why you would take pride in being retarded or uninformed. Then don't inform people, don't do the news. Um. And obviously, circumstantial evidence can be used to prove intent, of course. If, if I walk into a room and a woman is, is bleeding and is raped and has come all over her vagina and her neck is all bruised, this is all circumstantial evidence. If she's like knocked out or dead, I have to use circumstantial evidence to convict on the murder. And I can prove intent via the circumstantial evidence. Well, why have you, if you, she wanted to have sex with you, why is she so fucked up? Like, yeah, you, uh, I don't, it doesn't matter. Okay, sorry. Circumstantial evidence is fine. Circumstantial evidence can be very strong. Circumstantial evidence is oftentimes better than direct evidence. Eyewitness testimony is considered some of the best evidence in court, and eyewitness testimony is incredibly untrustworthy uh, at times. So, like, yeah, the idea that I hate this. I'm sorry. It's a meme. It's a movie meme. It's a movie meme. It's a movie meme. Everybody says circumstantial evidence. They think bad evidence, but it's it's. In the case of Israel, however, we don't really have this problem, since everyone from BB to President Herzog to the defense minister to a wide variety of war cabinet ministers and ruling party members have been happy to give quotes elucidating their genocidal intent. As South Africa accurately detailed- Do you, if Gaza doesn't have nuclear weapons, Israel has any military justification for nuking Gaza? I don't think Israel has any military justification for nuking Gaza. I don't think they probably will never have any justification for that. That would be wild. Failed in their ICJ filing. This assertion of complexity is a go-to tactic for Israel defenders, and it's quite effective, frankly. Many a liberal concerned about the humanitarian horror unfolding before their eyes can be shut down in an instant by a simple assertion that the situation's really complex, and therefore outside of the understanding of those without encyclopedic knowledge of every twist and turn in the historical record. Now, ironically, Norm, Muin, and Benny actually have that encyclopedic expert knowledge of- God, that's so cringe. Where did Norm showcase that ever in this debate? Of the conflict, which Destiny is himself completely lacking. But the tactic is such a go-to that Destiny attempts it anyway, even when confronted with actual legit experts. And of course, the history, the technical legal mind- Experts? Are we ignoring the fact that Benny agreed with me for basically 99% of this debate, or? Nusha, all these things are, of course, complex. And by the way, the places where I cut against Benny are probably gonna be places where she would agree more with me. Like, for instance, Benny's like, I don't, I think international law is bullshit. It's like, I don't think I would say that, right? The, the, ways, the ways that I break with Benny are gonna be ways that she would even favor. Ah, oh, okay. 
basics are not difficult to understand. It's okay. Palestinians were ethnically cleansed from their land. They live under occupation and blockade, both of which are. Oh. She's about to fall literally right into, um, right into one of the main talking points of why I wanted to do this debate. The mythologies, loaded languages, and international virtue signaling of both sides really hamper any ability for either people to make progress in this conflict. Because when you, ha when you tell the story with just one side, it makes it seem so obvious that the other side is wrong, and that's just not the case. It's just not that simple. At Destiny, when Norm told you that 242 was enforced before, after you said no one cares about it, because no one did care about it. And it, and it, and it never has been enforced. There's n n nothing, 242 is meaningless. Hello? Um, yeah, I can, I'll shoot your text, okay? Or wait, do you have Palestinians were ethnically cleansed from their land. They live under occupation and blockade, both of which are illegal. They are currently being slaughtered and starved en masse. You don't need to know what Theodore Herzl wrote in his diary in 1896 in order to understand these things. Although Norm, Moeen, and Benny actually do know such specific <laughs> details. Right? Well, Moeen didn't. Norm had no idea about it. Benny was the only one that had read the full diary. If you actually watched the debate, you'd know that. But again, I can't really fault her because she's just reading off a teleprompter and has no idea what she's talking about. But. Relatably, I don't think it's inappropriate for non-experts like Destiny, or myself for that matter, to have opinions and to voice them. I am and not in the same category as you. I would kill myself as I, if I was as uninformed on this issue on a fucking news program with a million subscribers offering up my teleprompter opinions about it. To defend them and to debate them, even with experts. I might just recommend a little bit of humility, awareness of the bounds of your technical knowledge as compared to legit historians who have spent their entire- There was only, and to be fair, again, there was only one historian in that conversation, and it was Benny Morris your adult lives studying all of the details. Now there is one- And yet don't know one of the two necessary elements of genocide, of which it was four times brought up in the actual fucking ICJ case that he said he'd read four times. Who have spent their entire adult lives studying all of the details. Now there is one final tactic consistently deployed by Destiny and Benny in this debate, which is worth illuminating, and that is the inconsistent appeal to international law. Now when it suits- Wait. I am so curious. Did I ever appeal to international law in this conversation? <sighs> Israelis, such as when discussing the original UN partition plan, then international law is everything. It's binding. When it doesn't suit them, such as when being held accountable for illegal settlements and war crimes, it's irrelevant. It's useless. Who cares? This selection. What? what? Of appeal to international law came out several times throughout the debate, but perhaps most notably in an exchange between Norm and Benny. Oh, she she's going to bring up the part. Oh. This is going to be where they, where they make a balance, and she's going to bring up the part where I said, hey, Norm, do you still support the Houthis? And Houthis says yes, in full violation of all international norms and law, in full violation of use ad bellum and use in bello, in full violation of uh, targeting civilian ships and killing civilians and doing for all of these. Yes, I do. I do actually support. She's going to bring up Norm's hypocrisy, and she's like, well, Norm's not perfect. Norm decries the illegal blockade of Gaza, and Benny replies that the judgment of these international bodies is irrelevant. No one cares, and that we should, quote, Forget the law. Take a listen. They were shooting rockets at Israel for, for 20 years. Okay, I, why is that illegal I, I to blockade I, Gaza? He thinks why, they bottle rockets. Why, 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 why is it times. illegal? I'll tell you why. You don't rocket okay, your neighbor. You I'll rocket your neighbor. You, Expect I'll consequences. I'll tell you why. Expect consequences. Then, uh, but I'll tell you why. Is he going to tell us why? Is he going to? Is he actually going to give us a reason why it's okay? That uh, works both ways. Yes. I know, and I Prof expect Prof that. Prof 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 both ways. I'll tell you why. Because every human rights humanitarian and UN organization in the world has said... You're I said that the blockade Nobody cares is, a about form of, is a form of collective punishment, Nobody cares which is about illegal amnesty. under... They also say that uh, that the indiscriminate rockets are illegal too, right? Amnesty International, 2009. Operation Cast Lead, 22 days of death destruction. Mortars and so-called Qasem rockets, which are locally made in Gaza, and longer-range grad-type rockets smuggled into Gaza via the tunnels from Egypt. Smuggled, hmm, are unguided projectiles which cannot be directed at specific targets. Attacks using such rockets are indiscriminate and hence unlawful under international law. International Forget law. The legal, the word you, legal think, you think a blockade... <laughs> you which, don't understand okay. the way the world works. Yeah. 
And, the, these and things you are think, irrelevant. And you think confining, because that's the blockade. Yes, you don't Confining, confining a million children. Combining, that's the choice combining, of Hamas. Combining that's Hamas a million choice. children in what the economist calls okay. a human rubbish the, sheep. The economist supported he, Israel in this war yeah. and continues okay. to support the, the economist. Why, why are we quoting a, the economist? The public, what the fuck is happening here? What is why, why did he? Why did this fucking moron print this out on a piece of printer paper to bring here and read this quote? Um, International Committee of the Red Cross called a sinking ship what the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights called a toxic slum. Like, you think these aren't arguments. You, you need to, you're, these are layman's arguments at best. I wouldn't even accept these from a layman, but you're, you're supposedly scholarly in this area, so give us the underlying arguments. We have you here so that we don't have to quote The Economist. Theoretically, Norm should be more qualified than every single person that he is quoting to make an argument. Like, could you imagine? <sighs> It would be like me quite quoting somebody who's like Gold League and StarCraft about how like a particular strategy works. Like, why? no, why the, I'm not gonna quote somebody who knows less than me. Why the fuck would I quote a lesser thing? You're the guy here. Why are you quoting these people? You should have the knowledge. What the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights called a toxic slum, you think- It is a slum, yeah, you, you, slum. you think but it's caused under by the international Hamas. law, you think it's legitimate- Forget to the law. Hey, I know you want to forget the law. What about it's the morality? one thing that forget every, is, what about it's what every Israeli fears the most. What? The law. As, no, as no, no. Sibi Lipney said, <laughs> I studied international law. I oppose international law. Of course you don't want to hear about the law. Then it's got nothing so, to do hey, with anything. Okay, so here's the thing. Yeah. Then don't complain about October 7th. If you don't Who's complaining about like, Israel was never like, oh, we need the international community to protect us from Hamas. We need the international community to protect Like, who is ever, what a weird straw man. Good. Have fun. Be careful. You me if you want to say, forget about the law, All I said was then, like then there is no international humanitarian law. There's no distinction between civilians and combatants. There, there should be. And so how be, no, now law. you're doing what we like, say? Like, do, do they distinguish between civilians and combatants? Like, what a weird thing. It's so funny. And this is always like the funniest thing in the, in the tool set of the Palestinian and the pro-Palestinian terror supporter, right? It's when they're like, oh, well, fine then. No, no international humanitarian law? Fine. Then guess what? Nobody's going to distinguish between civilians and, uh, and military targets anymore. Yeah, they don't already. <laughs> Okay, well, they're gonna shoot rockets uh, indiscriminately into your territory without even declaring war or anything like that. For no yeah, they already do that. <laughs> okay, well, um, they're going to, uh, uh, um, uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna not always wear military uniforms and they might store munitions and stuff in houses and apartments where you, uh, oh yeah, they already do. Like, what, what, are you, what are you even fucking saying here? I'm sorry, what humanitarian law does Hamas follow? That would have been a good question. Fuck, that would have been a killer question right here. Norm, what humanitarian law does Hamas follow? You need one? Get like a single one? Ed, you're becoming very selective about the law. <laughs> if you want to forget about the law. So Norm refers there to what Moeen had said previously about the selective appeal to international law. And in fact, Moeen did sum up this point quite brilliantly and succinctly. If you want to um, dismiss international law, that's fine. But then you have to do it consistently. You can't um, set standards for the Palestinians. What standards, bro? I also really don't like this. And the more that I think about this, the more that I think that this is an intentional tactic. This labeling, it's so funny because it's used on both sides. Um, it happens a lot where people on the right will label all Palestinians as terrorists or terrorist supporters, but then people on the left don't want Hamas to be drawn out and they'll make the struggle about all Palestinians. Like, um, but reject uh, applying those standards to Israel. Um, if we're gonna have the law of the jungle, then we can all be beasts and not only some of us. As and opposed think, to? Think, so it's either that or you have certain agreed uh, standards that, that are intended to regulate our conduct, all of our conduct. Like Hamas is holding a hundred hostages right now. That's a contravention of at least like three different humanitarian laws right now. You can't take hostages. You can't hold people. That's civilian. Sh that's human shielding. It counts as human shields if you have hostages who threaten to kill them in response to military activity. That's explicitly human shielding. You're not allowed to take hostages ever, um, and you're not allowed to take. Um, you, you can't target civilians, which is part of that as well. There's like at least like three or four. You can't. Uh, even non-state actors are not allowed to attack countries. No reasons. Three or four. Like you're you're breaking like half a dozen rules just on that one thing right there. Like, bro. Okay. 
not just some of us. So does international law matter, or do we all live by the law of the jungle? Might makes right. It's a good place to wrap up because that's really the core question being tested right now in the Gaza Strip. Can any of the international rules that were set after the horrors of World War II withstand the genocide being committed in front of our eyes with the direct aid of our country, the world's quote unquote superpower? Will distinctions between civilians and combatants or prohibitions on war crimes or genocide, will any of that survive this moment? Or will we drop even the pretense of pretending to care about these concepts and leave it, as Moeen says, to the law of the jungle where we can all be beasts? Because even the propaganda smokescreen, carefully erected over decades, cannot block the world from seeing the echoes of those World War II atrocities. You cannot see the images of the wasted, starved bodies of- Oh my God, and the faux outrage, the faux outrage here. As you read, did the teleprompter tell you to cry too? Oh my God. You cannot see the images of the wasted, starved bodies of Palestinian children without thinking about the Holocaust. You can't witness the utter destruction of Gaza and not think of Dresden or even Hiroshima. You can- <laughs> What? How many days was the Dresden bombings? How many people died in... Do you know what carpet bombing looks like? Bombings in Dresden were three days with up to 25,000 people killed in three days. I think I'm pretty sure it was like most of this happened over the course of like like fucking 48 hours, like, bro. And not hear the casual public dehumanization of human beings as animals and vermin and not think of Nazi ideology. The wall of Hasbara has crumbled and we are all left to wrestle with the grave crimes that are- Keep in mind, Dresden was not populated like Gaza as well. Like, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Are perfectly willing to commit. So Sagar, even though it was a yeah. Frustrating five hours low double speed, you know, two I and a half. I can't imagine that. That's a lot. Um, it gave me a lot to think I about. I like how she throws it in there like she's pretending like she watched it like 2 x Also, retweet this, please. I want to blow these people up. Please, God, please, God, please, God, please, God. She will never do it. I know she won't, but at least I can make them look bad. And listen, it, it was interesting too. Benny Morris is an interesting character because mm -hmm. he is a legit historian. Right. And Moeen and Norm clearly have a lot of respect for him and have actually relied on his scholarship about the Nakba in particular. Sick of being gaslit, these far left, these far left attack liberals, but then use liberal morality slash language to attack any perceived wrong action that in turn allows for any illiberal retaliation. You must follow international law, but we don't need to, true. Now they wildly disagree with his conclusions and they even, um, Press him on the fact that some of the conclusions that he comes to. Imagine she invites you to the podcast she, uh, with Kyle and makes you debate him and say, I'll debate both of them. I'll debate all three of them on this if they want. Are not supported by the body of work that he, you know, puts out there. But it was still, it was a very interesting exchange between the two. But, you know, having the destiny at the table also helped to illuminate some of these tactics that were used. So I do recommend tactics. it. I don't claim this was like a fulsome review, even though I know I'll talk for a long freaking time. Um, I do recommend if you have the time that you go and take a look at it for yourself and make your own judgments. I just pulled out pieces that I found were particularly for interesting. For me, it's just like with that guy, I mean, it's humiliating, honestly, on his behalf. It's like I would never have the temerity to show up to people who are genuine scholars. And Which is why he won't debate me on this or respond or say anything. I agree. That is good. You are smart for that. Truly try and accuse them of not knowing what they're talking about. If anything, I'm going to let them talk and I'm going to listen for myself the way you did. And that's kind of how I view my role. So anyway. Wow, Ryan Dredge, thanks for the 10 gifted memberships. In particular with him, I was embarrassed. I thought Norm's point was actually probably the best one, the one that you played at the end. He's like, all right, listen, if there's no rules and let's play with no rules. And I was like, hey, you know what? I mean, that is kind of what I believe. And I was like, you know what? That's kind of a good point. That's actually one where- That's how, that's what the other side already does. <laughs> if you believe international law is fake and all of that, that might is the only thing that really comes down to it. It's like, well, then you have to operate within the yeah. rules of anything is allowed. And I was like- You don't get you to condemn what? Hamas then. Well, but, but I was like, huh, that's a good point actually. Mm -hmm. And I was I had not thought about it that way. And if, when you do enter that frame of mind, then, you know, then you have to, you, when you do it that way, you can at least understand logically, like where both sides would be able to come from. So if we- what does this appeal to scholarship? Do these people think that scholars can't be wrong or challenged? Well, they're not even appealing to real scholarship. It's, it's none of these principles are, um, none of these are principle positions. Yeah. Sorry, what? Hamas then. Well, but, but I was like, huh, that's a good point actually. And mm -hmm. I was I had not thought about it that way. And if, when you do enter that frame of mind, then, you know, then you have to, you. Do any of the children's statistics factor into how many of these under 18s are active fighters? The October 7th videos look like a bunch of kids playing IRL Fortnite. 
Um, I, I don't I don't have a good answer to this. Somebody emailed me this once and I didn't dig in more. Uh, so I'm repeating this. I don't know if this is true or not. So take this with a grain of salt. But somebody, um, somebody emailed me once and said that the way that age groups used to be described um, is you would say like fighting age. Um, I don't know if that's true though. I never, I don't remember if he provided examples or not. I don't have this email anymore, fuck. Or maybe it was a subreddit post. But that, but that oftentimes in describing some of these conflicts, it would be like fighting aged men or fighting aged males. But that now we have like, now we've taken the Western standard of 18 or older is an adult and retroactively, or not retroactively, but we like superimpose that on every single conflict in the world now. So if you, um, if you're a 17 year old with an AK-47, you get killed, you're a child that died in war, basically, yeah. When you do it that way, you can at least understand logically like where both sides would be able to come from. So if we, it depends on the which frame that we want and his selective app. Okay, I have an interesting hypothetical. In the case Gaza doesn't have nukes, but Israel does drop a nuke in the near future, like tomorrow, for example, would you consider this evidence of genocidal intent because it isn't militarily justified? It would still be ambiguous and not meet dolus specialis. I, I think it would almost certainly be genocidal in nature. I would have a really hard time imagining any other type of justification other than genocidal if they were to nuke Gaza. <laughs> It would be really, really, really difficult in the real world right now. But we could we could hypothesize scenarios where I think I gave one before yesterday. Like let's say that Hamas reveals that they we or they find out that there are three nuclear uh, weapons, you know, in the Gaza Strip ready to be aimed at Tel Aviv, and Israel can't find them in time, and they think they need to preemptively strip or some bullshit like that. Wouldn't be genocide. They nuke the Gaza Strip at that point. 